the first film, we actually talked a lot about how Thorin struggled with being a leader. He thought he wasn't good enough. Do you think that he still struggles with that in this film? Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, for all of his failings, The Hobbit is succeeding and, and rescuing them from every plight that they face, every obstacle that's put in front of them. Up pops Bilbo Baggins to, to, to drag them out of their, out of their pit. Um, and it's forcing him to look at himself and, and question his judgment of, of, uh, of The Hobbit from, from the first part of the story. Um, but I think it's interesting because it's making him potentially going to be a better person and a better king. Their relationship, actually, between Thorne and Bilbo, it's so different now. They trust each other. Well, it's, it's certainly um, moving in that direction. I think, it's, I think it's reticent on the part of Thorin. I think he is slow to trust and, you know, you see him enter the mountain um, to save him, despite saying to Balin, I will not risk the quest for the sake of one burglar yet he enters the mountain. But whether or not that's because he cares about Bilbo or whether he cares about the Arkenstone is something that the audience really will be deciding for themselves. It definitely makes you think, especially in that scene between Martin and Smaug. There's so much to think about because we learn so much. Yeah, and what's interesting is that the dragon really gets inside Bilbo's head um, in the same way that he understands Thorin's greed. That dragon has such intellect and is controlled by by the evil um, power of Sauron. He's becoming a very useful tool in Middle-earth, so it's far more dangerous than, than just a, a malevolent beast. This film is so beautifully made. I think it's so artistic, and when I watch it as a viewer, there's so much to look at, and I'm in so much awe of how beautiful it is, but I'm assuming in person it was probably incredible. It's, it's actually more beautiful when you sit down to watch the film. We, we didn't have a dragon, we had, we had lots and lots of green. So if you don't really like the color green, then you, you're not gonna have a good time. Um, but seeing how incredible the dragon is in its full you know, digital glory and uh, hearing what Benedict has done with, with the voice of the dragon, which really brings that intellect that I was talking about and a, and a real visceral sound to his voice, which is, you know, the embodiment of, of that, that creature is, uh, is such a treat for me to see that. But not even just the dragon. I mean, I think that the entire movie as a whole, there are like four to five mini movies within this movie because each different environment has a different story. You're not the first person to observe that, actually. I came out of my first viewing thinking it's just not enough because um, it does feel like you, you're watching more material than you can deal with. And it's interesting because a lot of people perceive that, the, that they are stretching the story to make three films and they're not. They're actually having to cut so much stuff and it feels very full and compact and, and uh, you know, there's a lot of momentum in this second movie. Well, luckily we have three movies, right? <laughs> three more. One more to go, yeah. I'm curious, how is a movie like this shot? Did you guys already shoot all three movies? Or are you working it, on the third movie? How does no, that essentially we have shot all three movies. We went back this year for 12 more weeks and really finished off the third movie. But there's a small chance that we may get back to go to go back again, which uh, I wouldn't be opposed to. Made in Hollywood.